Hi, this is James Barris. I hope you find this talk supports you in your practice. If you'd like to support my teaching, you can use the donate button underneath my picture on Dharma Seed to do that. Your support is greatly appreciated. Tonight we'll um, explore the teachings of Ajahn Chah and I'll offer some reflections. Mm, As I said before the break, um, it is the um, 100th anniversary of his birth, uh, June 17th, 1918. He was born, and I want to share a little bit about about his uh, who he was and um, his influence, and a little bit about his life and his uh, as much as anything his teachings. Um, if you uh, go to Spirit Rock and go to the Gratitude Hut, uh, there's uh, how many people have been to the Gratitude Hut? Okay, if you go to Spirit Rock, you really should. Check that out. You walk right in, and there are um, prominently two teachers um, that are centrally featured, Mahasi Sayadaw and Ajahn Chah. And they are really our um, lineage holders. Uh, Mahasi Sayadaw, uh, a great Burmese master, Um, who uh, was the teacher of uh, Anagarika Manindraji, who was Joseph Goldstein's uh, main teacher, Um, and Ajahn Chah, who was Jack Cornfield's uh, main teacher and inspiration, and also uh, from Thailand, and also um, the teacher... um, of Ajahn Sumedho, who I often quote here, uh, Ajahn Amaro, uh, who used to live up at Abhayagiri, who now heads the uh, Amaravati um, monastery in England, and all of the Amaravati uh, affiliate monasteries, including uh, uh, Ajahn Chantikos in New Zealand, I mentioned earlier, and, uh, and Abhayagiri up North in uh, by Ukiah, uh, Ajahn Amro used to be a co-abbot there with Ajahn Pasano. Um, and there are monasteries all over the world from the Amaravati Ajahn Chah lineage. Um, also Aya Ananda Bodhi, uh, Tanisra, who's a, a, who's a teacher, Spirit Rock teacher, and Tanisra and Kitty Sorrow were both... Uh, uh, monastics in uh, in that community. Who else? Just lots and lots. Uh, Ajahn Chah's influence has been vast, and um, as I say, he's a uh, uh, the main lineage holder, bringing the Thai forest tradition uh, through Jack and others. These great monastics. Uh, that's come down to us um, in uh, Western uh, Western Dharma, mm. and uh, I had uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, spend some time with Ajahn Chah um, in uh, first in 1977. I, I sat the first three month retreat at Insight Meditation Society in 1976 uh, when it first opened, and after the retreat was was finished, m- my mind was blown, and my life was turned around, and I knew that the Dharma was, it was clear before, but even clearer was central to my life. I had been teaching school uh, in New York elementary school for um, uh, nine years by, th- by then. Uh, and I just knew that I had to um, put the Dharma central to my life. And so I, I, uh, it was the first year I didn't teach school, at least for the first 
half of that that year, um, and uh, then went traveling, actually for most of that year. And I, after the three month course was over, some people, uh, some of the teachers, Joseph and Jack, were going to Asia, and I said, "I'm going too. Can I tag along?" And they said yes. And uh, we went on this kind of magical mystery tour, uh, for me anyway, it was a magical mystery tour. Um, there's a picture here if you, if you come up afterwards and want to uh, take a look. Uh, I just happened to, I was looking through some photographs for another friend today uh, who I hadn't seen in years, and I said, oh, there's the picture I was looking for. Uh, I didn't know if I'd find it. And it's of... Ajahn Chah, we're all at Ajahn Chah's uh, monastery with uh, Joseph and Jack. You might not even recognize them if you say, "Who? Which, where are they? Well, Jack, you probably would. He's got big ears sticking out. Um, Ram Das, uh, Mark Epstein, who wrote some wonderful books, Thoughts Without a Thinker, um, Alan Clements was a Dharma teacher of uh, many years. Um, Catherine Ingram, wonderful uh, Dharma teacher who lives now in Australia. And we're all there with smiley faces uh, with Ajahn Chah. So that's, that's that. So, but what I wanted to say about that trip, let's see if I can find it. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, when I... When I went to, first we, we were in um, India first, and I sat a retreat there that Joseph um, and Jack led, um, and, um, and we were with Manindraji, who was a main inspiration. Then we went to Calcutta, and were with Deepa Ma, another wonderful teacher, amazing teacher, uh, who I highly recommend you check out her book, uh, the book on Deepa Ma's life and teachings. And then we went to Burma first and visited Mahasi Sayadaw. Mahasi Sayadaw, if you go into the Gratitude Hut, you'll see a picture of Mahasi Sayadaw. Uh, he, a couple of pictures. He has a fan uh, and he looks uh, a fan like a, a, a Bodhi leaf shaped uh, fan. He looks very serious. And we went to visit him and we were uh, in our uh, entourage. Oh, Stephen Smith, who is another uh, Dharma teacher is in that picture, was with us. And he and his wife, Chris, uh, Chris Smith, who's now Christine Yedica, had their two-year-old with us the whole trip. And she was just the cutest thing. She's now like that was, that was four, uh, almost 40 years ago. So she, yeah, it was over 40, 41 years ago. So now she's 43, I guess. Holy cow. Uh, I haven't seen her since. So I, I always think of her as this cute little two-year-old, um, Ch- uh, Chandra. And she was just so cute as a button. And when she, she was with us, she just made everybody kind of giggle and laugh. But when Mahas, she'd be around Mahasi, uh, it was in the Burmese tradition, it's, it was thought to be unseemly for uh, a, a, uh, an awakened being uh, in Burma anyway, this is what I was told, to be happy and smiling and laughing when there's so much suffering in the world. So it's, it's not good form. Anyway, so when he'd start to laugh, he'd put a fan up, right? <laughs> and then finally he'd take the fan down. You know, look very serious. And I was having a lot of doubts because uh, I was saying, "Is this where this is leading?" Because, because if it is, I, I don't know if I'm ready to sign up for it. Now I'm teaching Awakening Joy. So you can see there was something in me that uh, I was naturally, I, I wanted to just, 
I always, uh, there was a part of me that always, that loved to appreciate and love life, you know, and I was really having some doubts there. We spent a week practicing at uh, Tatanayekta, his, his monastery, and then we went up, we went uh, down to Thailand and visited Ajahn Chah's. And you can see from this picture, big smile on his face, just a great sense of humor, very deep teachings, but just was so light and so um, he just uh, make you feel all um, light inside. And I said, okay, if this is where it leads, I'm in. So uh, that was a very um, profound teaching in itself. That there's many different ways, and I'm not, and I have, we are, Mahasi Saido is a tremendous benefactor to us. Um, and thankfully, Manindraji, his, one of his main students, who was Joseph's main teacher, translated all the brilliance of what Mahasi taught in this very light, um, it's like going through what, the black box and it comes out the other way. And Manindraji, his teachings, simple and easy, you know, empty phenomena rolling on, just relax, rest in the moment. And so, and I've given talks on Manindraji here, uh, tremendously uh, grateful to him. Uh, but, <clears throat> so I have all of this, I have deep respect, and Masi is a benefactor. But Ajahn Chah, I could relate to the uh, down-to-earth, he was down-to-earth and very uh, funny and very, could be very fierce, but there was a real warmth about him. And I'll, I'll share some of the teachings, um, as you'll see. Um, so he came from the, the Thai forest tradition um, in northeast Thailand. He was born in northeast Thailand uh, in an area called Ubon uh, Rachatani. Um, and uh, that's where his main monastery, Wat Bapang, is now. And I'll tell you a little bit about his bio. Uh, of his bio, uh, after he was born in, like I said, uh, 1918, and uh, after some basic schooling, he spent three years as a novice after he graduated from, I think, what we would call elementary school. Um, but then, um, and oh, and as he he kind of jokingly says, as a child, he always played at being a monk. Other kids would play house and he'd play being a monk and go around with a make-believe begging bowl asking for candy and sweets, you know. He thought, well, that was a good thing to do. But he, he loved, he was always drawn to being a monk. Um, but then he, um, he went uh, back to help after his three years of being a novice, uh, um, he went back to uh, help out with the family and uh, on their uh, farm, I think it was. Um, but then he, was, uh, he kept on being drawn to monastic life, and at the age of 20, he ordained as a bhikkhu, um, which is a common age that uh, uh, people ordain. Um, and he, um, he went the traditional route where at the beginning, uh, in those days, one of the main paths that monastics took in Thailand was to um, uh, live in a monastery, do a lot of studying of texts, uh, learning Pali and all the discourses and uh, the suttas, really study-oriented, um, and some meditation, but that wasn't the, the main focus of it. Uh, and he he learned a lot, but it wasn't really transforming him. At the age of um, 25, his father became ill, and he went home and to uh, to be with his father during um, 
his illness and eventual death. And it really shook him because he saw how precarious life was and it really woke him up. It's kind of like the Buddha's um, uh, wake-up call when he saw that no matter how good he had it, he was subject to old age, sickness, and death. And that was what motivated the Buddha to uh, to give up the worldly life and go on his quest for enlightenment. Well, something similar like that happened to Ajahn Chah when he realized all of this study, all of this learning the texts, this is, how do I deal with suffering? I want to know that. I want to know the real stuff, not just the, the theory and the concepts. Uh, and so after his father uh, passed away, he left the study element of being a monk and became a wandering mendicant monk, which was another way that some monastics practiced, which is really the forest tradition in Thailand. Um, and he uh, was wandering around and just sleeping in forests, um, and he would sleep uh, where uh, with uh, where tigers and cobras uh, infested jungles, uh, scary places, and just really do it and come to learn the end of, of suffering. Uh, he did that for a, a little while, and then he joined a forest monastery um, where other monks practiced, and it was mostly monks practiced in that style, where it wasn't so much study, but it was about practice, uh, very strict adherence to the monastic code called the Vinaya or Vinaya, um, and um, just lived the life of a, uh, of a full-on meditating monk. But still, he was looking for, um, uh, for some deeper... Inspiration. He knew he still had a, a lot of uh, confusion. And then he heard about the great Ajahn Mun, who was the, the, one of the two main monks who brought the Thai, Thai forest tradition, revived the Thai forest tradition of living like the Buddha lived. And he was told that Ajahn Mun was a fully enlightened being. So he went and and sought to be with him and had a tremendously profound um, awakening experience. He was with Ajahn Mun, his main teacher, who he considers, who he considered his teacher. He was with him for three days. And he got what he was looking for. And after he got it, he said, N now I have to keep on deepening my own practice. And there were some complications as I, I just was hearing uh, somebody give, a, give a, a, a talk, a little explanation. He was from a, a particular sect that was different from Ajahn Mun's sect and it wasn't like, oh, we're all in this together. And I, I don't, it was the first time I actually heard it when I was listening today that, because I always wondered, God, three days? You're with the guy who blows your mind and inspires you? And uh, for whatever reason, he said, I got what I'm looking for. And now I have to uh, deepen my own practice. So first you might say, well, what did he get? Did that cross your mind? <laughs> uh, and it was uh, Ajahn Mun, and there's a wonderful biography of Ajahn Mun. Uh, uh, actually, I think it's an autobiography, or somebody has, has um, uh, uh, put it into a biography of his teachings, uh, the, t the uh, life of Ajahn Mun, uh, Mun, M-U-N. You can look it up. Uh, I forget exactly the name of, of it, but... And um, so Ajahn Mun was saying to him, or what he got from it, 
rather than to then becoming um, then being preoccupied with the mind that thinks notice the the knowing that is seeing this all and this might seem like oh but of course maybe you've been doing some meditating and of course that's you know and that's what we teach on retreats all the time except when you get it you really get it and he had a profound experience of seeing the mind that knows as being different than just this thinking mind and he had a a deep connection to as he would say and Ajahn Moon would say the one who knows the buddha knowing and i um let's see where is it I want to read to you a, a teaching of Ajahn Chah's. I'll share with you a few teachings as we're here that he kind of explain, expresses in his own words after years of hanging out, of being, uh, of this understanding coming through him. This is how he explained it. So here's my first teaching of Ajahn Chah's. About this mind, in truth, there's nothing really wrong with it. It is intrinsically pure. Within itself, it's already peaceful. That the mind is not peaceful these days is because it follows moods. The real mind doesn't have anything to do with that. It's simply an aspect, an expression of nature. It becomes peaceful or agitated because moods deceive it. The untrained mind is stupid. He does, doesn't mince words. The untrained mind is stupid. Sense impressions come and trick it into happiness, suffering, gladness, sorrow, but the mind's true nature is none of those things. That gladness or sadness is not the mind, but only a mood coming to deceive us. The untrained mind gets lost and follows these things. It forgets itself. Then we think that it is we who are upset or at ease or whatever. But really, this mind of ours is already unmoving and peaceful, really peaceful. Just like a leaf, which is still as long as no wind blows. If a wind comes up, the leaf flutters. The fluttering is due to the wind. The fluttering in the mind is due to those sense impressions. The mind follows them. And if it doesn't follow them, it doesn't flutter. If we know fully the true nature of sense impressions, we will be unmoved. Our practice, therefore, is simply to see this original mind. So we must train the mind to know those sense impressions and not get lost in them, to make it peaceful. Just this aim, just this is the aim of all this difficult practice we put ourselves through. Don't know if that, if you get a sense of what's underneath that fluttering mind when we get lost in thoughts about past or future or fantasies or why is this happening? There is an expression of our nature that is deeper than all of those stories that is naturally pure and flawless, intrinsically aware, and that when we touch that place beneath all of those thoughts and sense impressions, we see, oh, that's... That's who I really am. 
Not all of the stories I tell myself and confuse or frighten myself or get lost in. So he had this awakening experience. And then he spent um, the next seven years wandering in the forests to deepen his practice. And as I say, lived with tigers and cobras and uh, infested jungles. Um, to mainly to overcome fear because he he saw he still had fear, but it actually wasn 't fear so much about tigers and cobras. his real fear, and this might sound kind of silly, but it 's very common in Thailand. his real fear was of ghosts. And he knew that was the final frontier. So what he did, and I'm going to read to you another part of a Dharma talk of his, he decided to face his deepest fear. Ajahn Chah had tremendous, and he taught about having great courage and not Letting your fears stop you. Not that, he, not that you don't have fears, but if you really want to be free, it means facing even your deepest fear. So he decided to face his deepest fear and go to the charnel grounds where in Thailand, just like in, in uh in India, like in Benares, uh, they have burning ghats. They would have charnel grounds. They don't, they don't, you know, pretty up a body and and bury it and put some lipstick on it and say, "Oh yes, isn't uh, Aunt Harriet uh, lovely now?" They just, uh, they just see this is what the body does, and they burn it at, in front of um, with, with a ceremony. But this terrified him, and he said, "Okay." I'm going to go for it. So this is him talking about looking at his deepest fear. And it's from a Dharma talk. Mm -hmm. Take a look at your fear. One day, as it was nearing nightfall, there was nothing else for it. If I tried to reason with myself, I'd, I'd never go. So I grabbed an attendant and just went. It's time for it to die and then let it die. If my mind is going to be so stubborn and stupid, then let it die. That's how I thought to myself. Actually, in my heart, I didn't really want to go, but I forced myself to. When it comes to things like this, if you wait till everything's just right, you'll end up never going. When would you ever train yourself? So I just went. I'd never stayed in a charnel ground before. When I got there, words can't describe the way I felt. The attendant wanted to camp right next to me, but I wouldn't have it. I made him stay far away. Really, I wanted him to stay close to keep me company, but I wouldn't have it. I made him move away. Otherwise, I'd have counted on him for support. If it's going to be so afraid, then let me die tonight. I was afraid, but I dared. It's not that I wasn't afraid, but I had courage. In the end... You have to die anyway. Well, just as it was getting dark, I had my chance. In they came, carrying a corpse. Just my luck. I couldn't even feel my feet touch the ground. I wanted to get out of there so badly. They wanted me to do some funeral chants, but I wouldn't get involved. I just walked away. In a few minutes after they'd gone, I just walked back and found they had buried the corpse right next to my spot, making the bamboo used to carry it in into a bed for me to stay on. So now what was I to do? It's not that the village was nearby, either a good two or three kilometers away. Well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. If you've never dared to do it, you'll never know what it's like. It's really an experience. As it got darker and darker, I wondered where there was, where there was to run to in the middle of that charnel ground. Oh, let me die. One is born to this life only to die anyway. As soon as I, as the sun sank, the night told me to get inside my tent. 
I didn't want to do any walking meditation. I only wanted to get into my net. Whenever I tried to walk towards the grave, it was as if something was pulling me back from behind to stop me from walking. It was as if my feelings of fear and courage were having a tug of war with me. But I did it. This is the way you must train yourself. When it was dark, I got into my mosquito net. I felt as if I had a seven-tiered wall all around me. Seeing my trusty alms bowl there beside me was like seeing an old friend. Even a bowl can be a friend sometimes. Its presence beside me was comforting. I had a bowl for a friend at least. I sat in my net watching over the body all night. <clears throat> I didn't, uh, maybe, they, maybe it hadn't been burned. Maybe they just were, uh, were leaving it. I'm not quite sure. I didn't lie down or even doze off. I just sat quietly. I couldn't be sleepy even if I wanted to. I was so scared. Yes, I was scared. And yes, I did it. And I sat through the night. Now, who would have the guts to practice like this? Try it and see. When it comes to experiences like this, who would dare to go and stay in a charnel ground? If you don't do it, uh, if you don't actually do it, you don't get the results. You don't really practice. But this time, I really wanted to practice. When day, break, uh, when day broke, I felt, oh, I've survived. I was so glad I just wanted to have daytime, no nighttime at all. I wanted to kill off the night and leave only daylight. I felt so good I'd survived. And I thought, oh, there's nothing to it. It's just my own fear, that's all. After alms round and eating the meal, I felt good. The sunshine came out, making me feel warm and cozy. I had a rest and walked a while. And then I thought, oh, this evening I should have some good, quiet meditation because I've already been through it all last night. There's probably nothing more to it. This is not the end of the story. And it said, by the way, I, I read another version of it where that first night it was a little, it was a little boy. It was, a, it was so, it wasn't like a, a scary ghost. It wouldn't have been a scary ghost. It was just a, it was a small person. Well, that's good, I thought, bringing in this corpse to burn here yeah, is going to help my practice. Oh, then later, sorry, later that afternoon, wouldn't you know it, in comes another one, a big one this time. They brought the corpse in and cremated it right beside my spot, right in front of my tent. This was worse than the night before. Well, that's good, I thought. Bringing in this corpse to burn here is going to help my practice. But still, I wouldn't go and do any rites for them. I waited for them to leave first before taking a look. Burning that body for me to sit and watch over all night, I can't tell you how it were, was. Words can't describe it. Nothing I could say could convey the fear I felt. In the dead of night, this is in the dead of the night, remember, the fire from the burning corpse flickered red and green, and the, f the flames pattered softly. I wanted to do walking meditation from the body, but could hardly bring myself to, to do it. Eventually, I got into my net. The stench from the burning flesh lingered all through the night. And this was before things really started to happen. As the flames flickered softly, I turned my back on the fire. I forgot about sleep. I couldn't even think of it. My eyes were rigid with fear, and there was nobody to turn to. There was only me. I had to rely on myself. I could think of nowhere to go. There was nowhere to run to in that pitch black night. Well, I'll sit and die here. I'm not moving from this spot. Here, talking of the ordinary mind, would it want to do this? Would you take... Would it take you to such a situation? If you try to reason it out, you'd never go. Who would want to do such a thing? If you didn't have strong faith in the teaching of the Buddha, you'd never do it. Now, about 10 p.m., I was sitting with my back to the fire. I don't know what it was, but all of a sudden, there came a sound of shuffling from the fire behind me. Had the coffin just collapsed? Maybe a dog was getting the corpse, but no. It sounded more like buffalo walking steadily around. Oh, never mind. 
but then it started walking towards me, just like a person. It walked up behind me, the footsteps heavy, like a buffalo's, and yet not. The leaves crunched under the footsteps as it made its way round to the front. Well, I could only prepare for the worst. Where else was there to go? But it didn't co- really come up to me. It just circled around in front and then went off in the direction of the attendant. Then all was quiet. I don't know what it was, but my fear made me think of many possibilities. It must have been about a half hour later, I think, when the footsteps started coming back from the direction of the attendant, just like a person. It came right up to me, this time heading for me as if to run me over. I closed my eyes and refused to open them. I'll die with my eyes closed. It got closer and closer until it stopped dead in front of me and just stood still. I felt as if it was waving burnt hands back and forth in front of my closed eyes. Oh, this was really going to be it. I threw out everything, forgot all, uh, all about Budo, Damo, and Sango. I forgot everything. There was only fear in me, stacked in full to the brim. My thoughts couldn't go anywhere else. There was only fear. From the day I was born, I'd never experienced such fear. Budo and Damo had disappeared. I don't know where. There was only fear welling up inside my chest until it felt like a tightly stretched drum skin. Well, I'll just leave it as it is. There's nothing to do. I sat as if I wasn't even touching the ground and simply noted what was going on. The fear was so great, it filled me like a jar completely filled with water. If you pour water into a jar until it's completely filled and then pour some more, the jar will overflow. Likewise, the fear built up so much within me that it reached its peak and began to overflow. What am I so afraid of anyway? A voice inside me asked. I'm afraid of death, another voice answered. Well then, where is this thing death? Why all the panic? Look where death abides. Where is death? Why death is within me, an answer came. If death is within you, I heard, then where are you going to run to escape it? If you run away, you die. If you stay here, you die. Wherever you go, it goes with you because death lies within you. There's nowhere you can run to. Whether you're afraid or not, you die just the same. There's nowhere to escape death. As soon as I had this thought, my perception seemed to change right around. All the fear completely disappeared as easily as turning over one's own hand. It was truly amazing. So much fear, and yet it could just disappear just like that. Non-fear arose in its place. Now my mind rose higher and higher until I felt as if I was in the clouds. As soon as I'd conquered the fear, rain, rain began to fall. I don't know what sort of rain it was. The wind was so strong, but I wasn't afraid of dying now. I wasn't afraid that the branches of the trees might come crashing down on me. I paid it no mind. The rain thundered down like a hot season torrent, really heavy. By the time the rain had stopped, everything was soaking wet. I sat unmoving. So what did I do next, soaking wet as I was? I cried. The tears flowed down my cheeks. I cried as I thought to myself, why am I sitting here like some sort of orphan or abandoned child, sitting, soaking in the rain, like a man who owns nothing, like an exile? And then I thought further, All those people sitting comfortably in their homes right now probably don't even suspect that there's a monk sitting soaking in the rain all night like this. What's the point of it all? Thinking like this, I began to feel so thoroughly sorry 
for myself that the tears came gushing out. <clears throat> They're not good things anyway, these tears. Let them flow on out until they're all gone. This was how I practiced. Now, I don't know how I can describe the things that followed. I sat, sat and listened, and after conquering my feelings, I just sat and watched as all manner of things arose in me, so many things that were possible to know but impossible to describe. And I thought of the Buddha's words, Pachatam vedita puvin yuhiti. That's one of the chants. The wise will know for themselves. <clears throat> so facing one's greatest fear, not feeling ashamed of having fear, but be willing to stretch yourself and see there's a wisdom that can hold it all. This was a great part of his teaching. And his teachings, as I say, were filled with, with humor as well as wisdom. One teaching, uh, I'll just share a bunch of teachings that, uh, that, that came to me to share that I love. Uh, I was there in, in, at that 1977 uh, uh, magical journey when a famous teaching that is, is often uh, shared, uh, I saw, maybe he shared it with lots of people, but I saw it for the first time. He would see the, the, villi the villagers would come and ask him for teachings. And one person came, who, uh, who, uh, a Thai, uh, Thai villager, who said, well, could you explain your teachings um, simply? I, I, don't, I, I don't understand all of this doctrine and stuff. And he looked around him and he said, um, he reached for his cup and he said, you see this cup? This cup was made with a lot of love. It was given to me. It was, uh, it was crafted and given to me out of gratitude. And I like it. I really like it. It holds my water, helps me when I'm thirsty, I, I like it. If I can see this cup as already broken, this is the essence of the teaching. Sooner or later, this cup will break. While it's here, I use it and I enjoy it. But when it breaks, I do not weep because this is the natural way of things the broken cup teaching. And this is something he would teach about remembering impermanence, continually reflect on impermanence, on the suffering that comes with trying to hold on to that which is impermanent, and that we too are this selfless, impermanent flow of reality. So the teaching on the broken cup. Another teaching uh, this is a book, uh, by the way, called A Still Forest Pool, which has a lot of essence uh, of his teachings uh, beautifully uh, laid out. Uh, one of the things about the Thai forest tradition was, uh, as you can guess, they weren't so interested in learning all the texts and the doctrines, but in just really putting it into practice. So this is a teaching about the simple path Traditionally, the Eightfold Path is taught with eight steps, such as right understanding, right speech, right concentration, and so forth. But the true Eightfold Path is within us. Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, a tongue, and a body. These eight doors are our entire path, and the mind is the one that walks on the path. Know these doors, examine them, and all the dharmas will be revealed. <clears throat> when uh, Jack had been, he was a monk, I think, with Ajahn Chah for about uh, three or four years. And when Jack was, was leaving to come back to, um, to the States, he said to him, you know, I think I might 
want, I, I'll want to share what I've learned here and teach. Do you have any uh, suggestions for, uh, for teaching? And uh, Ajahn Chah thought for a moment. He said, uh, I can suggest one thing. Uh, why don't you call it Christianity? so brilliant you know it doesn't matter what you call it the dharma is the dharma don't go around trying to proselytize and be a buddhist speak in a way that people can hear and understand and that will touch them even more another time there's a few uh, stories that jack tells jack who had had some uh, brashness and uh, uh, chutzpah we could say a, a, an old Pali word, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in saying, um, you know, uh, you're not very consistent. You tell one person something and then you tell another person something completely different. You know, what, what gives here? You know, you, you, you're not consistent at all. And uh, Ajahn Chah looked at him and he said, well, it's like this. We're all walking a road, a path, and I know this path very well. And when I see someone about to go into a ditch on the left, I say, go right, go right. And then I see another person uh, going off to a ditch on the right, and I say, go left, go left. So there's not one teaching that fits all. Beautiful. And then another time, Jack, Jack said, um, you know, you don't seem to be so enlightened. <laughs> this is Jack, you know. You talk about enlightenment, you don't look very enlightened. You, you know, sometimes you're, you don't seem like you're, you know, comporting yourself with great dignity and things like that. And Ajahn Chah uh, said, it's a very good thing that I don't fit your image of what an enlightened being looks like. Because otherwise, if I did, you'd be looking for the Buddha outside of yourself and not inside. That's where the Buddha is. Don't look to me. See the Buddha right inside of you, which is something that I hope you understand from practice. If you hear somebody say something very wise, don't think that the wisdom is out there. It's just touching a place inside of you that says, yep, right on. A couple more before I go. And soon. Uh, at, when he came to uh, Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts, Barry, Massachusetts, and he was there uh, um, for a retreat that they were conducting, and Often we would do in the Mahasi practice style with mental noting and in the Mahasi style you're noting everything and you're, you know, in, uh, rising, falling, hearing, like that. And when you're doing walking meditation, Mahasi and Upandita, one of his main teachers, you know, would teach Go slowly like you're, you know, in a sanitarium and you're, you know, like a, like a, a very sick old person. You go so slowly and you notice every little microscopic movement. And so you'd be going, lifting, moving, placing, like that. And Ajahn Chah, this is not how he practiced but he'd go around to people who would be practicing on the big, huge front lawn in front of uh, IMS, and he'd be going to, to people, uh, going up to each person and saying something in Thai. And he'd say this, and he'd say in Thai. And uh, people wouldn't know. He thought that he was, they, they, they thought he was just being friendly and blessing them and wishing them well. But he was actually saying, I hope you get better soon. Uh, <laughs> I hope you get better, you know. I hope you stop your suffering soon, you know. Just having fun with it. <clears throat> and uh, let's see. 
Uh, I'll finish with uh, a, a teaching that I that I I love. This is from a still forest pool. In uh, in the end, there's some questions and answers, and the question is, I still have many thoughts. My mind wanders a lot, even though I'm trying to be mindful. Sound familiar? What should I do? And this is his answer. Don't worry about this. Just try to keep your mind in the present. Whatever there is that arises in the mind, just watch it and let go of it, letting it be. Don't even wish to be rid of thoughts. Then the mind will return to its natural state. No discriminating between good and bad, hot and cold, fast and slow. No me, no you, no self at all. Just what there is. When you walk, there's no need to do anything special. Simply walk and see what there is. There's no need to cling to isolation or seclusion. Wherever you are, know yourself by being natural and watching. If doubts arise, watch them come and go. It's very simple. Hold on to nothing. Sitting for hours on end is not necessary. Some people think that the longer you can sit, the wiser you must be. I've seen chickens sitting on their nests for days on end. Wisdom comes from being mindful in all postures. Your practice can begin as soon as you awaken in the morning and continue until you fall asleep. Don't be concerned about how long you can sit. What's important is only that you keep watchful whether you're walking or sitting or going to the bathroom. Each person has their own natural pace. Some of you will die at age 50, some at age 65, some at age 90. So too, your meditation practices will not be identical. Don't think or worry about this. Try to be mindful and let things take their natural course. Then the mind will become still in any surroundings like a clear forest pool. All kinds of wonderful rare and a- rare animals will come to drink at the pool and you'll see clearly the nature of all things. You'll see many strange and wonderful things come and go but you will be still. This is the happiness of the Buddha. So, thank you, Ajahn Chah, for your teachings and your wisdom and your humor and your commitment to the truth uh, that we all have benefited from and hopefully will pass on to others. Um, Sorry that there aren't time for, there isn't time for questions uh, or responses. If you have something you want to say, come on up and I can be here for a while. You might reflect on your own being or people who you care about and maybe all the people who can need support right now, just send some kind, loving thoughts to them. And include yourself. Appreciate yourself with kindness and compassion. May I see through my fears and wake up to my true nature. May I share my love well. And may our coming here together be a benefit to all of us, to everyone we know, and ripple out to be a benefit to all beings everywhere. May all beings know the highest happiness and peace.
Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Have a really wonderful week. And uh, hopefully see you next week. And uh, help stacking the chairs uh, neatly and uh, uh, go forth and share your goodness. <clears throat>